Thank you. My name is Kevin Schrader. I'm the technology evangelist for Zen Technologies. And uh, this is actually a presentation that's based off of one that I did at ZenCon last year. ZenCon is our annual conference. Um, <laughs> in that conference, or in that talk, I think I had an hour. So I've got about 15 minutes less to get through uh, actually more content. I've actually got two demos as opposed to one. Uh, so I've actually got a fair amount of stuff to get through here. Um, and with demos, you know, one of the things you're usually told is if you're going to be doing a talk, uh, try and stay away from demos. Since I'm not really one person to listen when people to give me good, uh, give good advice, I'm actually going to be uh, doing two demos. Uh, so we'll see how that actually works out. Um, so what we're going to be talking about here is scalability and what some of the uh, characteristics are of that from a generic sense. And we're going to take a look at how we can actually implement that in, our, in a Magento-based uh, uh, installation. And I'm going to be using one of our products to demonstrate it, but a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about are actually things that are um, pertinent, just even in, an, in a general sense. So even if you don't end up using some of the tools that I'm talking about here, I think that you'll still get a lot out of it because there's a lot of, uh, of uh, like I said, uh, general information that we're going to be uh, talking about here. <coughs> Uh, my name is Kevin Schrader, like I said. This is a little bit about me. I've uh, written two books. Uh, one of them is called The IBM I uh, Programmer's Guide to PHP. If you have no idea what the IBM I is, I <laughs> don't blame you. Um, but it's basically the IBM mid-rating system where PHP has actually really taken off um, in that system, uh, in many ways almost replacing Java as uh, kind of the de facto standard. Um, and IBM wanting to work with PHP saw us as uh, Zend as a natural uh, partner for that. And I wrote a second book called You Want to Do What with PHP, which is basically uh, taking some unusual topics that you wouldn't necessarily see in other PHP books um, and um, kind of going through those. You know, one of my favorite parts of one of the chapters was how do you hack a network protocol, which to my knowledge has not been in any other PHP book. But it was really an awful lot of fun to write. Um, like I said, I'm a technology evangelist. I used to be in services. I actually used to work with one of your, uh, with one of your new folks, Susie Salachuk. She actually used to be my boss. <laughs> so she can actually uh, probably tell you some stories about me. And if you're on Twitter, you can find me on, at KP Schrade. Um, my email address, um, I didn't put it up here, but it's kevin at zen.com, so it's incredibly easy. So if there's any questions or you have comments, uh, feel free to uh, contact me over email. And I also am going to be at the Zen booth downstairs. So if there's anything that you see here that you want more information on, uh, feel free to uh, uh, ping me there, and I'll be more than happy to show you more stuff. Um, I do have a blog. It's at eshrade.com. Uh, you can, uh, I have a lot of stuff there. I'm actually going to be posting uh, both my slides and I'm going to be doing a blog post on this as well. I was hoping to get it done today, but I just didn't have the time to do it. So you will find uh, most of the information I present here um, on there as well. We have a Facebook page. I manage that as well. So if you see anything weird coming off of there, it's usually because of me. And you have the Twitter account, um, both for Zen and for me, so you can follow us there. But when I was preparing for my ZenCon talk, I asked, uh, I basically asked Twitter um, a very simple question. Could your PHP apps benefit from being able, to, being able to process data or execute asynchronously? The most interesting, I think the, the most interesting part of this chart is the no. And there's not a whole lot of votes, but I think that this is actually pretty uh, uh, consistent with a lot of different applications. There's only 6% of the people who said no, we couldn't benefit from it. Basically, 94% of people, of, of the PHP developers, at least in my little Twitter community, which I, I'll admit is probably, you know, um, you know some of the, the, the higher experts in the, in the PHP realm. Um, but a lot of these people would say, yeah, you know what, I could use some benefit of doing, or there, there is benefit for me being able to do things asynchronously. And the thing about that is that even though we have 6% who said no, I would be willing to bet to you that only 6% of the people who said yes are probably actually doing it. Because it's something that is not necessarily natural for a PHP developer to do. And so what we're going to be doing here today is kind of showing how you can actually make it natural and make it easy to work with. So the first question I have here is, why would you honestly want to queue? Um, just, because you're, you know, just because you have a PHP application, you have a Magento application up and running, um, what are some of the benefits of doing queuing? What really is queuing? Queuing is just basically doing things asynchronously, making, making uh, uh, having execution occur as you have resources available. So the first one would be performance. Um, I went to the, the talk this morning on um, performance in, in, um, in, in, in Magento, and there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Um, but one of the things you can do to increase performance is to basically not execute. 
if there's something that you don't need to do right now, don't do it. And actually, the Magento system, as we'll see in a little bit here, actually provides a really great interface using the event-based system on how you can actually harness some of that. So you can make your, your application perform better simply by not executing uh, little parts of it. And then additionally as well, scalability. One of the problems that, uh, that uh, uh, PHP developers sometimes have is that they just they, th they throw load at their servers and the server just isn't able to handle it. Um, and part of that is just simply because their PHP applications are just doing too much. They don't have the resources to actually do what it is you're asking it to do. And so you have the ability to scale your system out simply by doing things as you have uh, that CPU or that, uh, that memory or whatever it is as you have that available. So those are the two reasons I think that are uh, primary why somebody would want to implement some kind of a queuing mechanism in their system. The problem is, is that with Magento, I think you, you have a decent architecture that um, lends itself to some of these components, but a lot of people have been building PHP applications like this uh, for years upon years upon years, where you have one file, where you have your presentation layer, you have some application control, a little bit of database access in there, all of a sudden you have a little bit more presentation, some more logic, and eventually you come out at the end of this page. The problem is, this is really bad for scalability. We'll see why in a little bit. So as PHP applications have uh, uh, matured over the past couple of years, we've actually started to see a proper separation of concerns in our application architectures, where you actually have presentation layer, which is your HTML, um, or in some case, well, I wouldn't even say JavaScript, but your HTML, your CSS, which is completely separate from your PHP. Then you have your application control, which could be um, like a, a Magento controller or something of that nature. You have your business logic, which is in your model layer, and you have your database access, access, which is done underneath that. So what you have is a much more defined architecture that you can splice apart and work with these parts individually, whereas with this previous one, you didn't have any separation. Everything was all in one big file or one massive includes, and um, this gives you the ability to implement some of these characteristics of scalability. So having these separation of concerns, having this distinct model layer, having separate controllers and things like that is actually really good for scalability. So that begs the question then, what helps to make software scalable? I think there's three um, individual points I'd like to address. I can't address all of them in the talk, um, but I think that some of them are that you have defined tasks or individual jobs. What that means is that you have functionality that needs to be executed. It doesn't need to be maybe executed at a given point in time, but it just needs to be executed. So you have defined individual tasks in your application. This is typically referred to as your model layer. Uh, loose coupling, in other words, you don't, you don't have very strong dependencies within your application. If you have dependencies, that means that you have to build those dependencies in, those dependencies need to execute, and that ends up dragging the, the overall performance of your application down. And so having some level of loose coupling, in other words, where you don't have explicit calls to explicit pieces of data or explicit pieces of functionality, um, this allows you to scale a little bit better because you don't have those same kind of constraints that you have to work with it. And then the last one is resource discovery. This, I think, is pr uh, quite paramount, especially if you're looking at the cloud uh, ecosystem, where when you actually deploy an application, you may not even know where that system actually resides. It may be in the same rack as one of your other servers, or it may be on the other side of the data center. Or if you're not being careful, it could be on the other side of the world. Um, and so having the ability to figure out where your resources are, and that resource could be data, could be a job, um, could be anything. Being able to figure that out as opposed to having that hard coded into your application really makes for allowing your system to be able to scale and handle more servers without having to have that predefined um, when you, in your actual deployment. So trying to minimize your dependence on, on configuration files that have explicit resource definitions in there. In other words, use your configuration files not to define your resources, but to, to define where to find your resources. I think that resource discovery is another uh, concept that is uh, beneficial. And what I think is the golden rule of scalability is that it can probably wait. Whatever it is, it can probably wait. We'll actually see an example here later on of something that is waiting, and it doesn't actually affect your, your end user experience. So when you're looking at your application, you're wondering, well, you know, I have long running request times. I'm not able to, I'm not able to scale beyond five or 10 servers. 
um, look at your application and see, is this something that I'm executing concurrently that I don't need to do right now? And so using that is going to be, or, or looking at that is going to be something that's really going to uh, uh, help you figure out what it is that can actually be executed at a different point in time. Uh, there's a couple of different uh, uses that you can have here. Um, Pre-caching data. I'm just going to tell you a little bit of a story about pre-caching data because <laughs> this actually, there's an unexpected uh, benefit to this. Pre-caching data is basically when you take a cold cache and you populate it with cache data. Um, <laughs> that's actually kind of distracting, I just realized. Um, Pre-populate uh, pre with cache data. The reason for that is that the way people typically do caching is that a request comes in, uh, tries to get cache data, that cache data um, is found to be out of date, and so you have a piece of logic that needs to execute in order to, de to generate that data and then put that back into the cache. That's typically the way people end up caching uh, stuff in their applications. The problem is, say for example, that you're using uh, Google Analytics and your password for Google changed and you didn't realize it or you knew about it but didn't think that your web application would uh, deal with it, and all of a sudden your Google, your, the, some data that you have on your website dependent on Google Analytics isn't being generated anymore. Uh, when you're dealing with a typical caching scenario, you actually end up having your site throwing an error until you actually fix it. By utilizing a, cre a pre caching mechanism in there, uh, what I did with this scenario was I would throw data into the cache, unlimited time to live on the cache, but I would have a job that would execute somewhere that would go to Google, Anal Google Analytics, get the data, and then push into the cache. But my Google Analytics failed, only the job failed because that cache data was still there. And so I was able to use that to actually keep my site up and running while I was having an authentication issue with, uh, with Google Analytics. Um, data analysis, clearly something you don't want to be doing at runtime, any kind of data processing, and also pre-calculating. Uh, one example that I sometimes give that people can do for uh, utilizing uh, a queue is something like ads. Uh, ad advertisement, or the, the logic to build an ad can actually be relatively complex. And if you're doing that at runtime, you're going to be re uh, reducing the amount of, uh, or let's say increasing, the amount of resources that you're utilizing at that individual point in time. So what you could do instead is say, okay, somebody makes a request, give them a generic ad or something like that. Um, but the next time, as you're, as you're actually doing that, kick off a job. So that the next time the, the, request, the user makes a request, rather than running through all that logic all at once, it can just go to some data source where this was actually pre-calculated and get it back for you. So it doesn't, it gives you the ability to uh, uh, reduce the amount of need that you have to do that at runtime. So you can have actually have a pretty significant savings in terms of your resource utilization there. And one of the things I know is really hard for a lot of developers to, uh, to accept is that data is out of date once it leaves the web server. In fact, I would actually say it's data is out of date by the time it hits the output buffer. Um, things can happen that end up uh, making your data inc inconsistent. And so just because you're building an application that has strong data ties across the course of the application, just because you have those data ties in that individual request does not mean that that data is going to be consistent because once that, there's always a lag time by the time that person sees in the browser. So when you're thinking about hmm, what should I actually take out of my inline request? Just bear in mind that the data that they have on the screen is probably out of date by the time they're actually looking at it. So that actually greatly expands the scope of the data or of the functionality that you can separate from your inline logic. Couple of considerations, waste disk space. Disks are cheap, they're cheaper than RAM. If you have the need to use disk space, use it. Um, you know, up until, I mean, even on, like I've got a, a VPS system that I have, cost me 20 bucks a month, I get, what do I get, I think 16 gigs of disk space. If I need to use that disk space for a cache, for example, I could have a cache thousands of layers deep, and I still would not impact the overall disk usage of my application. Same thing with archiving and things like that. When you're dealing with uh, an asynchronous mechanism, because you're not uh, dealing with the, the immediacy, the, the immediate need for an application to respond, you can go out there and you can waste stuff because you're, not, you're only wasting it if you're not using it. If you're using it and it's making your application better, then by all means use it. Um, control usage, 
Uh, don't let users do anything they want. Um, this, the, the thing that I'm thinking of here is somebody decides that they need to send out 100,000 emails um, and you let them. <laughs> um, in other words, when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you have a system that's designed to scale, make sure that you have limitations on it. This isn't even something that's specifically related to scalability, it's just a good programming practice. But when, somebody, when you're allowing somebody to do something and you're allowing them to do it asynchronously because you have the ability to, or you have the tendency to really use a lot of your components, a lot of the, the resources that you have, it's a good idea to make sure that you control that usage. Another thing could be, say, you have something running asynchronously to do some kind of a jobs report or a, uh, a sales report is a good idea, a good example. You really don't want to have that running during the day. So use a queue and schedule it to run you know, at midnight or 2 or something like that. So uh, uh, control the usage and don't let people just do things when they want, how they want. And using a queue allows you to do that. Pre-calculate as much as possible. That one, I think, goes uh, without much without saying. Keep your data processing off of your front-end web servers. Um, when, you're, when you're building a typical PHP application, I think that a lot of developers think that request re the whole request response, that that's, that's the, the scope of, that you have to work with. When you're building a queuing system, you can actually remove a lot of that stuff. So keep your data processing off of the front-end uh, front web servers and don't just, uh, um, you know, don't just, uh, I lost my train of thought. Anyways, <laughs> the last one. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. The last one. Uh, when I was in services, um, I was often called on to um, take a look at performance issues in applications. And time after time, the excuse that I was given was, yeah, we know that's a performance issue. We'll just cache it. Uh, caching is useful. Caching is good. Caching should not be your first line of defense. Um, so if you're going to build a cache, uh, build a scalable system, don't just say, oh, we're going to cache it because we're going to be building a scalable system. Um, think through what you're going to be doing and uh, you know, think it through. Um, one example is if you have so much data that's being cached on your front page, um, if you have, say, 100, 150, 200, just as some random numbers, um, the amount of overhead that you have by hitting that cache and checking the cache can actually, so in some cases, be more detrimental than actually doing the calculations in line. So don't just cache, because it, it's just putting a Band-Aid on a broken leg. When you build a deployment mechanism, don't use hard-coded values. There's things like uh, directory uh, locations, uh, well, directory locations, depending on what you're doing, um, server locations. Um, allow that kind of stuff to be discovered, going back to our initial uh, talk about what are some of the principles. Uh, decouple and partition, don't tie everything together very tightly, allow things to be discovered again, um, and use queues slash messaging. I'm talking in, my, in mine about uh, job queues where you have your asynchronous execution. I'm even talking about doing data queues and things like that. Things like Amazon have data queues available to you. Utilize these queuing mechanisms because they allow you to do things as you have resources available. Um, uh, Stomp interfaces are really good for uh, PHP. There's a lot, I know ActiveMQ, um, has a stomp interface. So I think RabbitMQ has a stomp interface. So utilize those when you're using any kind of trans, uh, transient data as opposed to just throwing into the database and polling the server every once in a while. Uh, ZenQ, which is a component in Zen Framework, is also uh, uh, has a bunch of individual interfaces that you can use there. And also do try to use stateless. Um, stateless interfaces are easier, easier to scale because they're easier to load balance. And so, and also polling is more scalable than idle connections. There's, an, there's a given number of connections that your individual machine can handle at a given point in time. And by polling, instead of, instead of uh, doing, using idle connections, you can often make those resources go a little bit longer. I was actually kind of a little bit uh, <laughs> upset at Amazon, which apparently, judging by this morning's keynote, I'm not the only one, um, that I couldn't, I couldn't just have a, a queue to sit there and wait. I started reading through it and trying to figure out, well, why, why don't they allow me just to have an idle connection and just return when I get data? Well, it's because if they did that, their system wouldn't be, scale wouldn't be as scalable. And so try to use stateless interfaces as opposed to stateful, long-lived requests if, you're, if scalability is a concern of yours. A um, couple of things to note about some of the options that you have. I know I'm going to step on a lot of toes <laughs> with the first one here. Um, but cron is an option. But I don't think it's the best option for if you're going to be doing asynchronous execution, simply because Cron is intended just to simply do scheduled tasks on an administrative level. I'm talking about stuff that's much bigger than that. 
Um, another option that you have is Gearman. Gearman is an open source platform that does some things uh, very similarly. Um, there's, very different, there's a very different interface to use, and it requires more configuration than what we're going to be looking at here, but it is an option. Use a homegrown one. You can do that, but I would recommend that you don't. And if you ever use PCNTL fork on an Apache process, <laughs> I will disown ever knowing you. Um, you should never fork an Apache process. Let Apache fork itself. Um, so, <laughs> hey, you guys put the mini into that. I didn't say that. <laughs> and then the last one is uh, utilize the Zen server job queue. And I will talk a little bit about that. Um, you really, looking at that previous list, there's really only two options that you have, Gearman or the job queue uh, in Zen server. Um, I won't go through the list here, but there's a whole bunch of, of reasons why you, you would use one or the other. I do think that the Zen server job queue, because of the way it works, and if you want more information specifically on how it works, I'll give that to you, um, you know, downstairs at the, uh, uh, whatever, the marketplace, or um, down at the booth, I can give you much more information on how that works. But the, the job queue is extremely cl cloud friendly due to the API that it uses. It uses HTTP, basically. So. This is the only sales slide I want to show you because you'd be looking at this and say, hey, well, what's this job queue thing? Well, it's part of Zen Server. Zen Server is our PHP application platform, uh, uh, web application server, and it allows, it, it gives you a whole bunch of stuff. Here's the stuff. If you want to see the other stuff, there's some really cool stuff. I'll show you downstairs, but I want to spend my time talking about queuing as opposed to giving you a, a, a sales spiel. All right. Job queue is great because it runs over HTTP. HTTP is extremely load balanceable. So there are two different options that you have for actually implementing this. Um, by default, the job queue will install on the local machine where the job queue is actually called. And that I have up here is your web server with job queue. When you actually execute the job, you would call it via, you would call the load balancer, which would then uh, run it on um, a third party web server, or not third party, but a web server that's behind the load balancer. Uh, the pros is that you can scale the back end um, as necessary. And it's also the easiest one to implement, the easiest mechanism to implement, because this is what the architecture actually works for. The problem is, is that you have, if you're looking for date status of the individual jobs, it's a little bit more difficult to actually get that information. Um, and again, I can give you more details as to why, but you know, for the time being, just trust me, that's a little bit more difficult when you have a, a higher setup. This here is actually my uh, favorite mechanism it requires a little bit more work up front, but I've actually done the work for you. I've got a, a library up on GitHub that uh, you can actually utilize for this, but it allows you to actually take a job, pass it off to a back-end job queue, and the job queue there will then manage it. Um, I've actually found that to be quite useful um, in some of the testing that I've done. So the, really the only con to that is they have to build your own interface, but you don't have to do that either because I've already done it for you. So the, favor the way that I like uh, to handle it is first create a task handling controller. We'll take a look at this when I get to my uh, Magento uh, uh, extension that I built. Um, but that was basically the place where the application actually runs. Uh, create an abstract task or job class. This is the job class that understands the job queue. Actually, in my case, I actually have a manager that does that, which then the, the, the abstract class talks to. But the whole point of this is that it's self-contained. In other words, you can actually write a job that can execute anywhere in the world, as long as you have permission. Um, you can execute anywhere in the world um, with a half dozen lines of code, and it's extremely easy to use. Um, if you're using the Elastic Backend, mechan which mac backend Mechanism, which was the first one I looked at, um, you can connect to the local host, or if you're using the Elastic Frontend, you can connect it to a load balancer and really scale out your backend, which is really cool from a cloud perspective as well. And really the crux of it, the way it works, is when you execute the task, the task serializes itself, passes it off to the job queue server. The job queue server unserializes it, executes a, uh, a special method that, uh, that has to be defined, reserializes it, throws it back in the job queue, and you can read the results later on. It's actually extremely easy to do. So in the demo uh, that I have here, I don't know, how much time do I actually have? I have 18 minutes? 15 minutes. All right. OK. <laughs> and let everybody stretch their legs. So I'm only down to five minutes now. Um, there's a couple of classes here that I'll show you. Um, I'm gonna, I have, like I said, I have two demos. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, a minimalist um, uh, uh, implementation that I built. 
uh, which is actually available. Actually, everything is available on Git. 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 What is it? GitHub. GitHub. My goodness. <laughs> this <laughs> the party we had last night. Um, this this manager. What it will do is it will handle the the uh, the execution of the, the task and handling the result. Uh, we have the job abstract class, and that class is actually the class that we're going to extend our job off of. We have the response. Because we're working in a system where you want resource discovery to be discovery as opposed to being hard coded, uh, this tells you where that job is located, what its ID is, and gives, allows you to check for the status of that job, which you cannot do um, just as a fire and forget. Well, you can, but you know, if you need to know when that job is done, you're not able to do that. And then I have another class here called Get Remote Links. This is a class that what it'll do is it'll just scan a web page and give you a list of all the individual uh, URLs that are listed on that page. Uh, the execution flow here is to first create a job and then set the data. This is, we'll set the data inside of the task class. Execute the job. That job passes off to the queue manager. The manager serializes the job, makes the HTTP call to the load balancer or directly to the system. Um, the queue on the, on the other end returns the job ID and the server name and the job ID and the server name is passed to the client. You can then serialize that, store it in the session, do whatever it is that you need to do, but then you can take that object and use it for getting that information. And then when you're trying to see whether or not the job is done, you pull the, the, the manager to see, um, is that job done yet? Is that job done yet? Is that job done yet? Oh, it's done. Okay, now I can go and I can get my response from it. And we'll see how that works right now. Okay, so this is the first demo. <laughs> And we'll see how it actually works. Um, I'll show you a little bit of code here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you, I'm actually going to show you none of the back-end management code. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I want you to see really how, how minimalist this really is. So I have a couple of uh, uh, files here. And I think is this, everybody can see this or see it well enough <laughs> if you squint. Um, there's only really one part that you need to worry about. It's this line right here, and I'll, I'll maximize this. Where I have new org eTrade job get remote links. This is done using PHP 5.3, uh, utilizing namespaces. Get remote links, which is the task that we want to actually execute. So I create the new job, passing in a URL that I had specified. Then what I do is I call execute on the job, and I take that and I attach that response, which is again that response object, and I attach it to the session so that I can use it later on to pull uh, that job. So that is this front page right here, which I refresh and it comes up and <laughs> it's actually working. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to submit this form. This is a, it's a Zen form based form. Submit the form and what it's going to do is it's gonna scan my magento or my mage.local uh, uh, web URL and give me the links. So what I'll do here, so you can see that, I'll click get output, we see waiting, and we saw that it pulled at least one more time. And then the next poll, we actually had the links actually in there. We'll do that one more time. So I click on get output and just watch that we do the polling or the waiting, and then it came back. And we can actually see what happened in our job queue. This is the, the UI for the job queue. And I look in here and I can see this is the job that I passed in. You can see that it's serialized. I have output. This is the result of that job. The way this job actually looks is if I go to my jobs, I have org, eshrade, job. Um, the actual task is this public function job. This is the one that actually does what it is that you want it to do. And you see here, I, I call my constructor where I pass in my URL like I did in my front page. Uh, that'll then get serialized at that point, and then it'll get unserialized on the job queue server, and the job queue server will execute this method here called job which just says an HTTP response, gets the body, and does a CSS query on the web page and stores all of those later on. Then what I do is I go to my poll.php file, and you remember that response object that I had earlier? I take it from the session, and I call get completed job with that job response. If that uh, response equals null, then that job has not uh, been completed yet. If it is if it does return a response, then I have that job, and you see here I can call get links on that. Uh, so that's just a basic run through about how it works. Like I said, it's very simple. It, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that kind of gets it, gets some of the stuff out of the way. But you can take this demo, 
run it on run it on a Zen server instance, and it works out of the box. So it gives you a little bit of stuff that you can work on. I have links at the end here. So cool. <laughs> well, how does that pertain to Magento? Um, E-commerce is all about user experience. Well, no, e-commerce is all about money, but the way you get money is by having a good, good user experience. And we talked about earlier how 40% um, of people wait no more than four seconds for a website to occur. If you have a 10-second response from your credit card processor, your customer might be going, what's wrong with this? Escape, reload. Okay, now you have two, <laughs> two charges that are occurring. Um, so having short running requests makes your uh, request, ma makes your user experience much better. Additionally, uh, you know, from a, a different standpoint, calculating your cash data on the fly can lead to a bad, bad user experience. Again, we're talking about people who want instantaneous data. And if they're waiting for the web page to load, they're not getting that. And also, if you have long-running page requests, they can start pushing up against max ex execution time. You might end up actually having a, a fatal error that occurs. This removes that as, as an issue because it's not being run in line with your front-end code. So the solution, as I saw it, was to build a Zen server integration uh, extension for Magento. Um, it utilizes the same classes that I built for uh, the, the demo, but it has a Magento-based... Um <laughs> Crash and burn. <laughs> um, it has a Magento-based uh, extension, uh, actually two of them. The first one is called Zen Server Job Queue. I'll show you that code in just a moment. And also another one that I built is actually called Zen Server Monitor, which is another thing that's actually really cool. Then what I did was I built something called Async Payment. It's another extension. And what it basically does is it hijacks the, uh, the existing mechanism and redirects it to the job queue so that you, don't, so that you can basically, with, uh, with one click, turn this asynchronous processing on. Um, I'll jump over that. So the, the example that I had was called Payment, again. Um, what I did is I hooked an observer into that, um, that event and basically rewrote things, injects some JavaScript in there that allows me to do some, some cool stuff. And what that basically ends up looking like is, actually, no, I'm not even going to bother showing that to you just because I know that we're going to be running a little bit short on time. But it does, but basically it takes that, that request, intercepts it, and then I created a separate job under here called payment. All this payment does is it, pre it pretends to be the browser. So we create a HTTP request and we submit it just as if it were coming from the browser. But because we've uh, <laughs> intercepted it, it's not being done by the browser, it's being done by the job queue. So let's show you a little bit of a demonstration about how this works. I'll go to my home page, and I guarantee you this is the only session where you can actually buy awesomeness. So <laughs> there is a charge for awesomeness. <laughs> We're talking e-commerce here. I got <laughs> I got to justify my salary. <laughs> it wants to be free but it's not. It's it's got DRM on it. <laughs> so we'll proceed to checkout and I will ship to uh, my home address which of course none of you are writing down. Go to my next step, I'll set my credit card number and Visa and I will continue. This is obviously I just set up to hit the one click. Now watch what happens in my Firebug here. I click place order and it goes to a different URL and I have this ping which is of course taking really long. Another ping. And now because all it did was I took the, the output of the, uh, the one click that we did asynchronously I just pass that right back to the front and, um, and forward it on at that. So at that point, we just basically had a one-click installation um, that made this up and running. And was that, the, was that the end of my time wave? Or I, <laughs> I have time for questions. Uh, what I'll do is I will, okay. Um, what I'll do is I'll put some of the, these, um, I'll put some of this information up here. This is stuff that I have up on GitHub. There are a total of uh, four, three, uh, uh, three that we have here. Or if you have um, a Bitly, I have the, the QR code there for a Bitly link that goes to a bundle. That bundle is also under the, the QR code there as well. And you can get all these links uh, from that uh, from that uh, QR from that Bitly link there. 
So I'll give you a second just to do that. So what this does is it basically allows you to take pretty much any part of your application. Like for example, if I, if I show you exactly how I hooked in here, um, we have this index controller here where I basically, this here is the code that we use to actually execute um, our, act, our individual method. And so you can get that and run it. And it's basically the exact same thing that I have on here. This is all that you actually do. Everything pretty much handles itself. Now, one of the things I did want to talk a little bit about, I don't want to do an awful lot of a salesy call because, or a salesy talk because, you know, this is a Magento conference and it's a PHP conference and, you know, you really want to see things that are kind of useful. But I also, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this one, this Zen Server Monitor. That's a, uh, an extension that I built that hooks into the monitoring system. And what it allows you to do is, I have a whole bunch of cool stuff here, but I really don't have the time to show it. I'll show you what the effect of that is. It allows you, one of the things that Zen Server does is it checks for individual conditions, error conditions, problems that are occurring in your system, and it stores a, a result of that. And we have this really cool feature called code tracing. What code tracing does, it's like a, we kind of liken it to a uh, black box flight recorder. And what it does is it captures uh, your uh, execution from start to finish, including parameters that are passed in, return values and things like that. And what I wanted to do is because building an extension that actually hooks into this is actually extremely simple and it gives you some access to some really cool stuff, um, I wanted to put that in there. Um, just because, like I said, it's extremely simple. This is an observer that you hook in. We call this Zen Monitor Custom Event and it gives you uh, that event uh, information there. And the way you de uh, determine, determine it is you can specify the individual events. In this case, I did a controller front init routers. Um, that's the individual event that causes it to, uh, uh, to trigger that custom event. So that's something that you might want to just take a look at simply because based off of what you do, you, a lot of what you guys do is business critical. You really do need to see, have insight into what's actually happening in your application um, on a production system. I'll just wait for a couple of the phones to be able to get it. But I'll, I'll come back to this right at the end while we're asking questions. Um, we also have a Magento Zen case study talking about a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here. There's another link here. And again, you can get that on um, there. Again, follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. And with that, let's see if we have some questions.